Hello, welcome to the swine section for the livestock management CDE. Uh, this year our topic is going to be the quality assurance and herd health management. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me via email. Uh, my email is uh, benny.moat at unl.edu. Moving right into the objectives, we expect the students to know and be tested on. So we're going to hit on several of the bigger swine diseases out there in the industry that we're worried about. Uh, such as PED, PERS, and African swine fever. Uh, with that, we're going to move into biosecurity, touch on some of the risk of disease uh, introduction and transmission, uh, go through shower in, shower out procedure. Uh, we're also going to talk about medication treatments, so medication labels, recordings, withdrawal times, uh, proper needle gauge, uh, length and selection, and also we do want to emphasize this year we will have a hands-on component of this and I'll just be kind of upfront and say I expect people to be able to uh, handle move swine. Uh, we'll pick some pigs somewhere between a weaning pig and all the way up to maybe a sow. Uh, the students uh, go through weigh the sow or animal know how much uh, to give uh, a medication via the medication label and then also uh, do a mock injection at the proper location. So I uh, just want to be pretty upfront what we're going to be expecting here this year. Uh, so to start with some of the diseases, PED or porcine epidemic diarrhea. Uh, this is a coronavirus uh, that affects the cells aligning the small intestine of the pig. So it essentially causes the nutrients to not stick to the, the intestines and that for the um, they're, they just have diarrhea. Everything they, they have goes straight through. So severe diarrhea and dehydration. Uh, it causes uh, diarrhea of all ages of pigs, but it has uh, especially a potent impact on the succulent pigs uh, because of the intestine here. Uh, so the mortality rate in those succulent pigs of naive herds anywhere in that 80 to 100% range. So very, very deadly for, for baby pigs that are still on the sow. This is a virus, it uh, only affects swine, uh, and it is uh, essentially not a reportable disease, so this one will not affect any export markets, uh, as we did have this in uh, 2013 uh, show up in the United States for the first time and still are battling it today on occasion. Furthermore, for PD, uh, the virus is spread via a fecal oral route, so the most common sources are infected uh, feces of pigs, uh, trucks, boots, clothing, and other fomites. Uh, and really want to talk about how infectious this uh, disease is. So even just as small as the thimbleful, uh, the disease actually can, of, of manure, uh, can actually infect an entire finisher barn. So it doesn't take very much to infect a very, very large, uh, substantial number of animals. Uh, proper sanitation, so cleaning, washing, as well as a lot of people started baking their trailers. So they'd actually take trucks and trailers and run them into heated bays and heat the bays to over 150 degrees for at least 10 minutes to inactivate the virus. Uh, that method's also good for an inactivating virus on uh, other equipment as well, just not on trucks and trailers. Uh, PER, so porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. Uh, it's an uh, enveloped RNA virus, a little bit different than our other one. Uh, we call it a production limiting disease. It's only affecting swine. And again, this is also one that is not a food safety concern or a human health concern. Uh, it is highly infectious as well. Uh, occurs in pigs of all age groups and has the ability to persist in individual pigs and herds uh, far greater than uh, 200 days. In young pigs, so the growing and finishing pigs, uh, you primarily see fever, depression, lethargic animals, uh, stunted growth uh, due to some systematic diseases and definitely pneumonia. So you get into that uh, uh, respiratory syndrome portion there. On the breeding herd, you run into reproductive problems. So you get that increase in premature farrowings, you get late term abortions, uh, increased stillborns and weak pigs and mummified uh, fetuses. So definitely a, a double whammy here. You have less animals and also those animals that do come out are sick and persistent. 
PERS is mainly spread uh, via direct pig-to-pig -pig contact. Uh, risk factors for spread between farms include proximity to neighboring farms. Uh, so how close your farm is to another farm of, that has swine. Uh, if you purchase animals from a farm that is PERS positive, you can definitely pick it up as well. And it has been shown to be transmitted via semen uh, if it, you use from PERS infected boars. Uh, we can also pick this up with me mechanical transportation. Uh, so you can have contaminated needles, uh, the boots and coveralls, uh, if you don't change those between farms. Uh, farm personnel, if people don't clean their hands or boots or, or clothing again. The transport vehicles, uh, even uh, some things such as insects or how flies and mosquitoes have been shown to uh, transport PERS. Additionally, uh, PERS has been shown to spread via airborne. Uh, so even a mile or two away, uh, if you're downwind of another farm that has PERS, you can pick it up or even pick up PERS from passing uh, two trucks uh, side by side on, on the interstate with one having PERS and the other's not. Uh, there is no good vaccine. Uh, that covers all PERS strains. There is, there are some uh, vaccines out there uh, that people do, and these are ones that kind of try to mitigate some of the effects, but they do not offer a full coverage as of yet. So again, uh, biosecurity is our best defense to, to keep this, this virus out. Uh, African swine fever, uh, big, big news item here as of the last two years. And actually, uh, it is not currently in North America. Uh, this is one that is a World Organization for Animal Health reportable disease. So if we were to pick that up in the US, uh, it would stop uh, pork exports immediately. And that would cause an estimated loss of $8 billion in that first year alone. So uh, stop us from shipping animals or shipping animals and pork products worldwide. And today, the U.S. pork production, we ship over 26% of the pork product overseas. So definitely, definitely something that would impact the U.S. wine production. Uh, as of about August of 2018, uh, there were some massive outbreaks in China and then further along into East Asia. Uh, it's estimated that 40 to 65% of the Chinese herd has either died or been cold uh, due to African swine fever. And uh, just to put a, a figure to this, so prior to African swine fever, uh, China had half of the world's pig population. It's estimated that they have 40 million sows, where in the US, we only have a little over 6 million. So if you just want to put how big an effect that has on the world pork population, uh, you're essentially looking at saying a quarter of the world's pigs uh, have been killed or uh, cold due to African swine fever. Uh, there is no uh, current vaccine, although people are working uh, very, very hard on this at the time. Uh, but currently, unfortunately, there is no vaccine for this. Uh, again, African swine fever is a viral disease. So like all the diseases we've talked about, it's viral, impacts only pigs, not people, and it is not a public health threat. So African swine fever is a very large double-stranded DNA virus. So it's actually one of the largest viruses known out there. And it causes hemorrhagic fever uh, with very high mortality rates in domestic pigs, uh, anywhere estimates of up to 100% of all infected pigs. So uh, definitely well into the 90s. So it's something that we do not want to get uh, into the US uh, swine herd. Virus can be spread. Uh, transmitted uh, direct or indirectly with contact with infected pigs, feces, or bodily fluids uh, from those infected animals. Uh, ticks as well can spread the disease, so they would suck on an animal that would actually be infected, and then if they move on to another animal, uh, they could spread that. Uh, that's why we're highly concerned about the wild boars uh, in the U.S. If it gets into that wild boar population, the spread of this could be very large if it were to get into the U.S. And additionally, this can be uh, spread to pigs by feeding pigs of pork products that were not fully cooked. So we need the pork products to be over 165 degrees to kill that virus. Uh, so there are several states in the United States that can and are still allowed 
uh, to feed uh, human garbage, human food waste. Uh, if they do that, they are required by law to cook, fully cook all those products before they feed those to pigs, but that is a risk. Uh, additionally, right now, the U.S. has taken several precautions. Uh, so we are increasing the holding times on feed ingredients. Uh, so we actually do import a lot of our vitamins and minerals from China. Uh, there are some organic soybean meal that is being imported from China. There's things such as cat food, dog food, and some different uh, intestines and casings uh, for things such as hot dogs, et cetera, that are coming from China. And so we are trying to increase our holding times on those products. Uh, so that way, if there is virus there, uh, it is inactivated by the time it would potentially reach a U.S. swine farm. Additionally, uh, there's been an increase in dogs, specifically the beagles, uh, at the U.S. Customs of uh, ports of entry, so airports and seaports as well, uh, that actually go around and uh, use their nose and try to sniff out where people are trying to illegally or inadvertently uh, bring food products in uh, that could uh, harbor these diseases. So, so definitely something that we're being uh, very cautious about here in the U.S. at this time. So as you can see, uh, biosecurity is something that is very near and dear to swine producers' hearts. It's how we keep a lot of these diseases out. So all these diseases that I mentioned earlier, something that we don't want in our farms. And so we're gonna go through some biosecurity practices that uh, will help us uh, keep those out. So biosecurity is simply management practices to prevent the introduction of, and transmission of disease into a herd. And I like to tell everybody, it's not just uh, trying to keep the diseases out of our herd, but if we do have diseases uh, in our herd, it is also our responsibility not to spread the dose to our neighboring farms. So we don't want them uh, to be uh, dealing with the same diseases that we are, if we, if we can at all avoid it. Additionally, uh, there is the saying that most diseases enter the swine farm on two legs or four. Uh, it's simply saying to you there's somebody walking it into the farm or bringing uh, infected pigs into the farm. Uh, but we're going to go through a few of the routes of, uh, of uh, transmission. So several different things. So transportation is a big one. So our trucks and trailers, uh, we want to make sure that they are all clean and disinfected. We want to make sure that especially if those animals or if those trucks or trailers have hauled to a packing plant, a kill facility, or an outside farm, that they're fully clean, washed, and disinfected, and baked uh, if we have that ability. Uh, I tell everybody on swine farms that if you see a truck back up to your farm and that it to load up pigs, your clean farm, and they back up with a dirty trailer, uh, you have the right to refuse those. Uh, trailers make them go wash and clean and disinfect before they back up. Uh, feed biosecurity, so uh, when PED was spread in the United States, uh, we did see where it can uh, stay alive in the feed stuff. Uh, so we wanna make sure that everybody is treating their feed uh, very carefully, making sure that uh, we aren't taking it from farm to farm if you have some left over in one feed bin. I uh, didn't infect the farm, don't take it to another farm because you can infect that other farm. Also, we wanna make sure our feed trucks are cleaned, washed and disinfected, especially uh, the tires of those trucks and those uh, truck drivers, when they get out on the ground and unload, we wanna make sure they put on, on different boots uh, or little booties uh, to cover up so that way, wherever they've been at previous farms, they're not tracking it on your farm. Uh, equipment, we prefer that all farms have all the necessary equipment uh, in place so you're not sharing between farms. Uh, but if this is not a, a possibility, uh, we want to make sure that all the equipment is uh, properly disinfected, either using a black light or, you know, using disinfectants such as Synergize or Tectrol, those things on the equipment. Uh, we want to limit the exposure to rodents, wildlife, and birds. Uh, we know that uh, they can all carry diseases, so we want to make sure uh, we keep our mouse and rat population in check, and we want to keep birds out of buildings. So if you have the ability to put up bird netting uh, to keep birds out, that is highly recommended. We bring in new animals. 
uh, especially from an outside source or that have been up and down the road somewhere where you can't control what they might have been exposed to. We want to make sure those animals go into an isolation facility and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then um, probably most importantly is the entry of staff and visitors onto the operation. We want to go through specific uh, ways for those uh, people entering your farm uh, to go through so with that on entry of staff and visitors, uh, we wanna make sure that everybody showers in and out of the facilities uh, that limits disease coming in and out of a farm. Uh, so we wanna make sure that they fully change clothes and footwear uh, between farms. I uh, wanna make sure if somebody is bringing in a cell phone or computer uh, that they are cleaned and disinfected prior to doing so. My personal recommendation is to not allow uh, those to come in through the farm just because how hard they are to actually clean properly. We want to make sure everybody eats and drinks in designated areas. Kind of as I mentioned before, you know, there are some of these diseases such as African swine fever that can uh, be found in uh, some pork products. So we want to make sure that no scrap could ever make its way into uh, pig food. Uh, so we want to keep that out of the pig pens in those areas. And we want to make sure there's a plan for international visitors as well. And I would say that we need to make sure we have a 72 hour downtime uh, between uh, pig farms, especially if they're unrelated pig farms, uh, to that way to limit the amount of uh, virus that could still be carried on you or in you in your lungs or those things that could go there. And for international visitors, especially if anybody's coming out of Asia, uh, we wanna have that to be a one week downtime from from when they were last in uh, a contaminated country to when they might go into your pig farm. So I will tell everybody to just expect a um, barn entry scenario. Uh, so in this case, uh, you have the outside door. Uh, so you you have your driveway, your parking area for everybody. They come in the outside door. You have a pass through window where you might be able to set your food on or you have something that needs to go into the office. Uh, so you can still walk in with your regular shoes uh, in this area. However, when you get to the bench, uh, you sit down on the bench, you take your shoes off, and then you swing your feet over, not allowing them to touch on the, what I'm considering the, the kind of the dirty side here. Kind of go into more of the clean side, you come down the, the hallway, and in this scenario, you have four different lockers. You come into one of the locker rooms, uh, you take off uh, all your clothes. Obviously with this scenario, we would not have uh, students do that. They would have to just talk us through that scenario. You put all your dirty clothes in the locker, you would take a shower, and then you would step into the clean side, dry off, put on new clothes, and then go into the facility. So you wanna make sure you know how to walk through that scenario. And then when you're leaving, uh, it would be the reverse of that. So you come in the clean side, uh, you leave your barn clothes on that side, take your shower out. Uh, so that way you're ready to go out on the, on the town and go ahead and pick up your street clothes again. And then you would walk out and put your shoes back on and go out the door. And then for the animals, um, because uh, they can pick up diseases in route, you know, things like PERS, PED, those can be picked up from two passing trucks uh, going down the highway. Uh, you want to have those animals in an, an off-site location, uh, if possible, or at least in a different route, locked off room or sealed room. Uh, you want to check those animals and you really want to check those, uh, if it's the same personnel at your farm, you want to check those at the end of the day. So that way they have time to go home, get a shower before they come back into the farm. But you always want to watch those animals, preferably for 30 to uh, 45 days. Uh, to check for signs of diseases before you allow those to go into your regular farm. Moving into animal treatments. Uh, so, you know, these are medications intended to help pigs recover from health challenges. So medications are not effective against uh, viral pathogens, just like, uh, you know, us going to the doctor to ask for medications when we get the flu, uh, it's not effective. Uh, so if you note all three of the diseases I mentioned earlier are all viral. So none, there are no uh, medications or antibiotics, I should say. Antibiotics are not effective against viral pathogens. Um, so 
these antibiotics are not effective against any of the uh, diseases that I mentioned earlier. We mainly have three routes for administration of uh, these uh, medications. So oral, topical, and injectable, we'll go through that in a second. And when we're doing injectable, we wanna make sure that we're using the correct needle size uh, for the size of the pig and the rat of injecting. So either subcutaneous or intramuscular. And we want everybody to be able to read, understand, and follow those medication labels. So that's gonna include withdrawal times as well. Uh, recording lot numbers, those things. And it is required by law for us to uh, save, to record treatments and to save those records for one year. So be prepared to, to be able to at least say, say that it is required by law and save records for a year on these uh, antibiotics. So administration methods orally. So there are some where we can uh, mix the antibiotics or medications into the water via medicators. You know, it's less stressful. The pigs are going through the water anyway, unless they're really sick. Uh, we don't have to worry about broken needles or injection site reactions or those things. And I will say that if you're using uh, oral, whether it's food or water, uh, the withdrawal time begins when there is no longer any antibiotics available to the pigs via feeder water. So when those empty, those feeders run empty, and when you stop putting the medication in the water and let the water lines flushed out. So topically, these things are applied to the skin. So it's like sprays, dust, pour-ons, and dips. So mainly things for like parasite control, uh, those things like that. So uh, think of like uh, uh, Ivomec or those things to, to, for parasites. And then the most common is more uh, injectables. Uh, so when animals are too sick to eat or drink, or when it's a small in number, you don't want to treat an entire 2,500 head barn, you just need to treat a few, uh, you will reach for injectables. So we want to make sure that everybody knows uh, where to give those as well. So I'm giving injections, so the two routes, intramuscular, so in the, in the muscle or subcutaneous, that's under the skin. Uh, so depending on the size of the pig, so either baby pig, nursery, finished, or breeding stock, uh, you're going to use a slightly different needle gauge, so how big around the needle is, or length, so just the sheer length of that. And so a lot of the times you will need to, you want to be able to refer back to, to this uh, sheet, this guideline, to know what size you need to go. And I will... I will be up front and say that we will probably have something like this available uh, for people to use as a cheat sheet to, to know what size they need to, to go with. So intramuscular injection, so while this they're showing the injection uh, site on a baby pig, it's the same where it's a baby pig or all the way up to a sow. Uh, the preferred place for intramuscular injections is in the neck uh, because one, we know where that site is at so if we do have a broken needle we know where to potentially go and look for it and then two it is a low value cut of meat so if we get an injection site uh, infection uh, we can trim that off and it won't affect uh, a high dollar cut of meat and because we want to make sure to keep needles out of the food chain uh, never use a bent needle uh, never straighten a bent needle uh, those needles have a very high probability of breaking the next time you use those. And we definitely want to keep that out of the food chain. Nobody wants to be uh, eating a uh, pulled pork sandwich or any of those things with pork in it and, and find a, a needle in it. I mean, it's a, it's a health risk. It's, a, you know, it's just a risk in general, and we don't want that to ever occur. Medication labels, I uh, want to go through several uh, different things here. So we want everybody to read and understand a medication label. Uh, so for this example, uh, we have the trade name here up at the top. We have the active ingredients, uh, directions for use. So that's obviously one of the bigger ones we want to do. And so for this one, it lists what animals it can be used in and says intramuscular use only. So on that case, then the, it, the the medication can only go into the muscle. Uh, indications for use, so what it can be used for, <clears throat> excuse me, the dosage, so based off the weight of the animal, 
uh, how many milliliters or, or cc's that an animal would get uh, for treatment, some of the cautions and warnings, uh, it says the size. Down here, very important thing, so the lot number, uh, we need to keep a record of that uh, for all of our records so that way we know if there is a recall on a, on a lot number, uh, we know we can track it down and know what it is. And the expiration date, uh, so when that uh, medication is no longer able to be effective. And we definitely need to know the withdrawal time. So after you treat an animal with that, how many days before that animal can go to market? We're gonna walk, walk through a couple scenarios on that here in a minute. And then the storage requirements, uh, we wanna make sure that everybody uh, pays attention to that. So most storage requirements either is gonna be at room temperature or those things are going to be uh, uh, stored at maybe a four degrees Celsius or more like in a refrigerator. So very important for people to, to know and, and understand uh, this medication label. Withdrawal times, uh, so we're gonna just uh, practice on a couple of them here. Uh, so flumoxamine uh, has a withdrawal time of 12 days. Uh, so in this scenario, the last time it was given was June 6. And so when, uh, when is the withdrawal time complete? So simply add 12 days to June 6, so that put it out here to, to June 18th at that same time of day that you gave the injection uh, when that animal can actually go to market. So yep, back here on the 18th. Uh, another one, uh, this uh, medication has a shorter withdrawal time, just five days. Uh, and on this scenario, it was given on December 12th, so when will the withdrawal period be complete? Uh, you simply add the five days on to the December 7th, and that gets you out to December 12th when you could ship that animal. You get into some that's got a longer withdrawal time, so stuff like Carbidox is 42 days. Uh, again, it's the exact same thing. Uh, you have uh, June 4th, uh, then you would just simply add 42 days on that, just a little longer scenario because of the time length. And you know you need to be out to July 16th uh, before you can uh, actually ship that animal. So, it's important to also record treatment. So it is actually required by law for us to record treatments and maintain these records uh, for a year. And so this one has a, a lot of different things on it uh, that it would be good to record on. Most of these are actually required for us to do. So the date you give that uh, medication, uh, the animal ID is, is required or the pin number, uh, the product name, so what uh, medication you're given, how much you're given is required to be on there. Again, this is dependent on the weight of the animal. Uh, the route, so in this case, intermuscular here, uh, the initials of who administered it uh, has to be recorded and then get into a draw time. So this has a 30 day withdrawal time on, on this scenario. And then so you know when it is actually withdrawal or the withdrawal date is completed and then some different things you could follow up on as was it effective or not and who was the required vet. So definitely be ready to fill out one of these sheets based off of a scenario uh, that we give you. Uh, we'll probably tell you a certain animal in a pen is sick, but want you to weigh it, uh, know how much uh, medication to give an animal, and definitely want you to record it and know when you can actually ship that animal to market. And with that, uh, that should be about it. Again, if you have any questions on this, uh, you can feel free to email me at benny.moat uh, at unl.edu. Uh, if not, we will look forward to seeing you here coming up in, in April. And good luck to everybody. Thank you.